on YouTube, there exists a channel by the name of Umami. The channel was launched on September 14th, 2017 and has a primary focus on obscure, surrealist animation. On December 7th, 2017, Umami would release their pilot episode for a web series by the name of Interface. The series consists of just 9 episodes at the time of writing, and each one ranges roughly from 2 to 6 minutes. Interface is a surreal tale that takes place in Montreal, Canada, following the direct experiences of Blue Guy, also known as Henrik, and a nightmarish shapeshifter by the name of Mischief as they explore a world devoid of any sense of personality. Along the way, we'll encounter various other characters in a few world-building episodes by the name of Cammy, Mr. Greetings, and The Ghost, among a few others. The episodes are largely laid out in order, with the exception of three of them, and we'll soon come to find that these three outliers serve the purpose of building the plot behind this world. When we walk through this, you'll come to notice that the series seems to be largely inspired by the works of David Firth, and according to Umami himself, this is absolutely the case. If you enjoyed Salad Fingers, then you're really, really about to love the world of Interface. In episode 1, we're greeted by none other than Henrik as he examines a few mannequins in a store window. Interestingly here, we can notice that these figures have static running through their eyes, and we'll soon come to find out why in a later episode. Anyway, right after this, the other main character, the shapeshifter, Mischief, greets Henrik on the street, giving him a peculiar introduction. So, after seeing this, we now know that Mischief isn't a human, and he's being powered by the same ominous static that filled the mannequin's eyes. He gives background on himself as someone who was once on a ship in 1943 that, presumably by the power of this electromagnetic field he references, teleports from Philadelphia to New York, encapsulating the entire crew within its hulls. If you're unaware, this event has direct parallels to a widely circulated hoax that originated back in 1943 called the Philadelphia Experiment. The knowledge from the supposed experiment originated from two letters that were sent by Carl Allen and Morris Jessup, who claimed that a secret experiment was taking place in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. While this was happening, the ship, much like an interface, teleported to New York, then to another dimension where it encountered aliens, and then through time, resulting in the death of every sailor on board as they became fused into the ship's hull. Episode 2 serves as a direct sequel to the first, and in this one, Mischief transforms into a bus. Afterwards, he then proceeds to ask Henrik for a desired location, and after silence from our main character, Mischief claims that if Henrik doesn't choose a destination, he will. Get on. I can take you anywhere. I'm not going to hurt you. Where would you like to go? 
genocide, I will. Along the way, we're able to notice that the bus passes by many notable Montreal landmarks, such as the Turcot Exchange, Olympic Stadium, and Mount Royal Cross. While on their ride, we can also notice that we do pass by many people, however they all seem to appear to be shrouded in darkness and exhibiting behavior that appears lifeless. At the end, we see the pair arrive at the Montreal Art Museum and Mischief changes forms once more, this time turning himself into Henrik's suit, thus making it pink. Episode 3 is where things become tangential. I believe that this episode is absolutely the entire key to the foundation of Interface's story. In this, we're able to see an initial shot of an ominous blimp with the words, Greetings Robotics printed on the side. This is our first direct introduction of the major corporation that looms over society in the world of Interface. After the camera pans away, we're greeted with a tech conference by a very soulless CEO as he presents the latest and greatest technology harnessing a certain, strangely familiar form of energy. Plagued with an immaterial, cerebral electricity. Ghost stories and myths became no longer superstitions, but a horrifying reality that we've been forced to recognize. We have since learned that this electricity was not a foreign substance, it had simply revealed itself for us to observe, to understand. Through the combined efforts of brilliant scientists, engineers, backed by many nations and corporate sponsors, we have finally been able to shine light into this darkness. As CEO of Greetings Robotics Corporation, it is my pleasure, my honor, to present to you Canon Generation One. Cerebral electricity, huh? Interesting. So, this cerebral electricity was, quote, not a foreign substance. It revealed itself for us to observe and to understand. Think about this. This, apparently, was a substance that was always there. It wasn't created, and it wasn't introduced. It wasn't even found. It revealed itself, leaving humanity fascinated by its presence and proceeding to observe and harness it. Also, Kami seems to have a strange Japanese symbol on the back of her neck. Keep this in mind. We'll come back to these topics later. Episode 4 is another world building side entry, and I believe that the major takeaways from this one are the opening shot of the TV exhibiting a face strikingly similar to what we saw in the cerebral electricity that Kami harnesses, and the segment at the end, where we see another character called the ghost, becoming enveloped in the cerebral static that's excreted by Kami. Sidetracking here, I want to note something. We see a car accident at the very beginning, and the aftermath of this results in the car sinking into the water, presumably killing the driver. When this happens, a hand appears to lift the little girl out of the water, who is also in the car, in hopes of giving her a new life. After this, we see Kami on the horizon as she proceeds to wreak havoc on a building completely destroying it, before completely enveloping this hand into the cerebral electricity. I absolutely believe that this is an episode that's aimed at presenting the true power of Kami. The ghost, I believe in this case, is a clear reference to God, and it seems that Kami is draining the power out of him in order to inherit the status of her predecessor, God himself. Kami is now God, and this entire situation arose from the works of mankind themselves. This entire scene also appears to be a direct reference to the painting, The Creation of Adam, by Michelangelo, which features the hand of God giving Adam life. In the case of Interface, the two become increasingly out of reach, 
furthering the possibility that God is no longer able to save this dystopia that humanity now resides in. Episode 5 picks up directly where Episode 2 left off, at the art museum. Here, we're able to see Henrik and Mischief as they make their way through the empty building to a painting that strikingly resembles a work called The Son of Man. Here, Mischief then begins explaining something that seems to conflict with the events that took place prior. I'm so used to spaghettification as my method of transportation that I forgot what it was like to be human. What a familiar feeling. The restrictiveness of the human body. To see through your eyes, the world around you still looks no different to me, but it's what you desire that brought you here, and these are the things I'm blind to. I know when something is obstructing your way. But it's what you desire that brought you here. And these are the things I'm blind to. Now wait a minute. If Mischief claims that Henrik's desires brought him to this art museum, how did he choose this destination for him if these are the things he's blind to? Hmm. Also, we can notice that in the Son of Man painting in the World of Interface, Henrik appears to be this man obstructed by the apple. This, alongside the flower that Mischief transforms into, are two objects that are strikingly out of place in this dystopia. In episode 6, we open with Henrik in the museum's elevator. When he reaches the top, he's greeted by Mischief in front of a painting by the name of Birth of the New Man. After this, we can briefly hear him try to explain that if you exercise, your DNA completely changes before being cut off by the museum intercom. He then proceeds to compare himself to Henrik, and with this comes a very interesting tidbit of backstory. Do you know, regular exercise can change your DNA, one of the most important- Attention visitors, the museum will be closing in 15 minutes. Please make your way to the exits. Let me just show you this before we leave. Painted in 1943, the year of my transformation. I was like a little baby chicken, breaking through to explore the unknown. Leaving Earth behind, a shell of its former self. Something is telling me this is what we have in common. The only question is, when you broke free, what did you leave behind? So, here, we have Mischief ask Henrik, when you broke free, what did you leave behind? Before explaining how he left the Earth, which became a shell of its former self. Keep this in mind. I want to touch on the end portion now. Afterwards, we're greeted with a bit of dialogue from Henrik's daughter, as an audible voice originating from the mind of Henrik. She pleads that her mother passed, and that her father seems to be the same age that he was when she was just a child. During this segment, we're also able to observe Henrik photographing a huge explosion, while concurrently appearing completely immune from it. That never happened, but I have memories. After mom got sick, during the funeral, the pastor just stared at you. I was too young to understand, and 
Maybe I still don't. I'm old now. Like you should be. But I need to ask. When I join Mom, should we wait for you? Will you ever come? The questions that I'll leave you to take away from this episode are this. What was this blast? What did Henrik leave behind? And how did the Earth become nothing but a shell of its former self? Let's press on. In episode 7, we have another side, world-building sequence of events that open with a narrative from a voice that, going by the description, is that of a man named Mr. Greetings. This sounds strikingly similar to the voice from the CEO of Greetings Robotics, and I believe that it's safe to assume that these two are one and the same. Anyway, he professes something that I believe is extremely notable to the story behind this series. 4.6 billion years ago, gravity pulled the gases of a giant molecular cloud to form the sun. The remaining materials formed what is called a protoplanetary disk. Our Earth was formed. Later came the first proteins, RNA, DNA, life. It wasn't an accident. It is thought that there are one billion trillion stars in the observable universe. It was statistically likely to have occurred. Over time, the atoms and molecules that make up each and every one of us rearrange themselves. Over time, they have strived to become more complex. But why? Over time, the atoms and molecules that make up each and every one of us rearrange themselves. Over time, they've strived to become more complex. But why? This absolutely seems to be what Mischief was referring to whenever he claimed that our DNA is able to completely change with exercise. Now, what is that exercise exactly? Later on in the episode, we're able to see the Greetings Robotics blimp in the night sky. While it floats along, we can see that inside is Cami, and a machine proceeds to attempt to harness the power exhibited by her. When doing so, the blimp is given life itself, then immediately drained of it while a soulless Mr. Greetings observes the phenomenon. In episode 8, we pick up right after the events that took place in episode 6 when Henrik fainted. The episode opens with him in a hospital bed watching TV that's playing a very outlandish set of commercials. Monster collection. Beasts. Ghosts. Scary demons. I'm coming for your blood. And more. But be careful, their claws are sharp, their teeth are sharper, and they don't take no for an answer. Hazmat's Monster Collection for the kid with no fear. Why is this disturbing content on TV and aimed at kids? It seems almost as if the youth in this dystopian future are being spoon fed this filth day in and day out resemblant of being brainwashed. The episode then proceeds to a point where Mischief arrives in bird form and has a word with Henrik. Tweet, tweet, tweet. I'm trying to be a bird. I haven't quite figured it out yet. How are you feeling? Did you miss me? 
Not feeling talkative, eh? Let's see what the doctors had to say. Ah, so that's your name. Henrik Niebieski. Born 1910. There's something you aren't telling me, isn't there? I bet the nurses in the next room are wondering how a man over a hundred years old has skin smoother than theirs. Strangely here, he claims that a man as old as Henrik has near-perfect skin, before a cut is made with Henrik's face on the cover of a fashion magazine. Afterwards, Mischief explains to him, if he stays here any longer, they'll keep him for their own. And here, my friends, is where we're directly shown something that we've already established prior. Henrik is different. He isn't like the rest of society. He has color and life and a strange, enigmatic personality. But why? The most recent entry is episode 9. Presumably where the pair landed after floating away in the parachute, this episode takes place in a diner with a strange octopus. When we approach him, he explains to us that the store is closed until 5, before Mischief starts to question him, with an interesting result. Isn't that a bit cannibalistic of you to be chopping up sea creatures? The strong eat the weak. But what about parasites? Isn't that what you're doing, Miss Chief? Guilty. After this, the octopus explains some visions that he's been having lately about an entity so powerful that can only see the world in black and white. When shown these visions, we can see that it is, without a doubt, Kami. Concurrently during this, a very ominous man enters the diner and proceeds to slowly approach the trio, and after staring at them for a bit, Mischief cuts Octopus off, inferring that his story is, quote, about that creepy guy that's staring at us over there, before turning into a fly, landing on him, and explaining that... Hey buddy, you're a bit early. The restaurant doesn't open until 5. Before the episode ends. This series undoubtedly has many, many meanings and interpretations all woven together into a beautiful and immersive showcase. Art like this has the possibility for endless interpretations, and I completely encourage you to project your own thoughts on what this all means. With this being said, here is what I believe Interface is about, in my eyes. For my first theory, I'd like to start by saying that I believe that the key to this lies during Episode 3. As we know, the series opens with Henrik checking out some mannequins with static in their eyes. Interestingly, this static has the title of Cerebral Electricity, as shown during the conference. While this is going on, we're able to see Mr. Greetings as he speaks on the podium, and strangely, his eyes are completely black, almost as if he's completely soulless. If we take a look at the audience, they all appear to be either drained, out of it, or in a state of hypnosis, as they blindly admire the artificial intelligence that Greetings Robotics had created. Kami, also known as the Kinetic Autonomous Mechanical Interface. Sidetracking here, if we do some digging on the Japanese symbol shown on her back, we can come to learn that the symbol is a direct translation of the word Kami, which is a spiritual presence that's widely worshipped in Japanese culture. This world is creatively dead. Everything is becoming automated and powered by this cerebral energy that I absolutely believe is sentient and had revealed itself to be experimented on. While this is happening, the world is wholly being placed into the hands of a physical, man-made deity. 
being Cami. Buildings, landmarks, vehicles, everything are subjected to this, and it's all being done by a major, soulless corporation that's after nothing more than satisfying their bottom line. In a way, it's almost as if society has a form of cerebral static in their own minds, being that they can no longer think, creatively or critically, and nobody converses, interacts, or quite frankly even cares to anymore. They live day in and day out in an automated and soulless world of endless marketing, social media, and entertainment being shoved down their throats, and they eat it up. Henrik appears to be mentally immune to this and sees this figurative world as it is, completely apocalyptic, completely bland, drab, uninspiring, dull, and void of any sort of creativity that was ever present in the world that he once lived in. This could directly explain his desires being the art museum. He has a craving for the creative energy that once existed in this world, this same world that Mischief referred to as now a shell of its former self. Speaking of which, where does Mischief come into play? The two met during the very first episode, however, interestingly, Mischief is powered by this cerebral electricity himself. So what gives? I believe that either A, this is a manifestation of his own creative mind, or B, Mischief and Henrik are the exact same people, being two sides of the same coin. What if, in the story that Mischief explains in the very first episode, is actually what happened to Henrik? What if this is why he's so immortal? What if, this entire time, he's dead? For my second theory, I'd like to take you way back to episode 1. The very first shot that we see in the entire web series is Henrik staring at some mannequins in a store window. Right afterwards, Mischief appears, seemingly for the first time to Henrik, and proceeds to give a backstory of his entire life. With this in mind, jumping forward to episode 2, we see Mischief transform into a bus, and while Henrik is inside of it, he asks for a destination, before explaining that if Henrik doesn't choose, he will. Interestingly, in episode 5, which takes place right after this, we arrive in an art museum, where Henrik proceeds to admire a painting that has a character bearing striking similarities to himself. At this point, Mischief appears and explains that Henrik's desires are what brought him here, before claiming that he is unable to feel them. Backtracking to episode 2 once again, we can remember that he said that he'd pick a destination for Henrik if he doesn't do so himself. If he isn't able to sense desire, how did he know that Henrik's desires led him to this place? Are the two somehow connected? Hmm. Pressing forward, Henrik is shown to have a strange invincibility in episode 6, and this became apparent after a certain blast changed the world. Now, why in the world would Henrik be able to survive such an event, and how come, in episode 6, when his daughter is giving her speech, she claims that the pastor stared at him at her mother's funeral, and she was too young to understand? Why is it that she says that Henrik should be old now, as she is, but is stuck in the same age that he was when she was a child? Also, in episode 8, as stated by Mischief, how in the hell is it that Henrik is over 100 years old? What if, way back, Henrik allowed himself to be experimented on, in turn becoming a perfect, personality-driven robot that's highly superior to Cammy? Now before you shrug this off, allow me to explain. Mischief is the key here. If we look at Henrik, he comes off as a dull, quiet person that doesn't seem to speak, eat, or really do anything. He seems to lack a purpose in this world, merely wandering around aimlessly until a task or event comes his way. This is when Mischief arrives. Henrik appears to go along with everything Mischief tells him to do, and going by the dialogue in episode 9, he speaks for him too. What if Mischief and Henrik are one in the same? Mischief even claims in an episode that something led me to you. Is this what that something could be? Henrik's entire personality could very well have been mischievous and fun, a total far cry from how he actually comes off in this series. Looking at him in episode 5 and episode 9, when Mischief is hitching a ride in his suit, 
he comes off as a completely different person, full of life. This is when I'd like to touch on another pivotal point in this theory, lying in episode nine. has no effect on those who see the world in black and white. Hold up. Is this about that weirdo staring at us from the middle of the room? One interesting tidbit about that speech was that he claimed that this vision encompassed an entity that could merely see the world in black and white, zeros and ones, and it would be pointless to attempt to camouflage oneself from something that could not see color. So, Cammy arrives in the diner, taking a different form than her ordinary robotic self. After the octopus is giving his speech about the visions that he's been seeing, which are of Cammy, Mischief stops him and claims that it's about the creepy guy who's been ominously staring at them in the room. I really, really think that Henrik is much more like Cammy than we think, and she's been tasked with hunting him down. This hunt is heavily referenced in episode 8, when Mischief claims that the nurses would keep him for their own if he stayed there much longer. Cammy is on the hunt for him because, as we've established, he is different he's actually able to see the world in color, he's able to admire art, he is able to make genuine friends, and he, himself, is an all-around superior version to her. This humility is, much like the apple in the museum, what gets in the way of Henrik understanding his true capabilities. And so, mischief comes into play to balance his personality, guiding Henrik on a journey of awakening and self-discovery, granting him a purpose. The question is, in future entries, will Mischief continue to exhibit the same kindness that he has been, or is there something ulterior in mind?